Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the biggest ever worm lizard has been discovered, wolves in Africa might be pollinating plants, and Mars once had the ideal conditions for life. Before we get into the news, be sure that you're subscribed to the new home of 7 Days of Science, the 7 Days of Science YouTube channel. Previously, episodes have been on the Benji Thomas YouTube channel. Now, they're all going to be on another YouTube channel. You can still watch both channels, just go and subscribe to the 7 Days of Science YouTube channel as well. This episode is officially the last ever episode of 7 Days of Science that will be uploaded to the Benji Thomas channel. So from now on, all 7 Days of Science episodes will be on their own YouTube channel. Got it? Is that an ice cream van? So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss future episodes. Is it an ice cream van? Also, if you go over to the new channel now, there will be an extended version of this episode that includes extra stories, so be sure to watch that. Unless you're watching it on the new channel, I forgot to take this bit out, in which case, I don't know. Is it an ice cream van? Because I want an ice cream, if it is. Our top story this week is the discovery of the biggest worm lizard we found so far. It's a new species known from fossils that were uncovered in approximately 47 million year old rocks in Tunisia. And what a beast this would have been. The worm lizards are a group of mostly legless lizards called the Amphisbanians, which evolved leglessness separately from the snakes and other lizards such as slow worms, first appearing in the late Cretaceous some 84 million years ago. Amphisbanians also have some of the scariest looking skulls I've ever seen that literally look like movie monsters, so... This new species has been named Terastiodontosaurus marcelo sanchezi, and it may have grown to over 900 millimetres in total body length, or more than 35 inches. This beats the record for the largest living species, which has a total length of 810 millimetres, or 32 inches. So Terastiodontosaurus was a true giant among worm lizards. Although most living Amphisbaeans are burrowers that spend most of their time underground, it seemed that this prehistoric giant would actually have lived above ground, where it hunted down small invertebrate prey. The scientists estimate that, for a worm lizard, this new giant species would have also had a very high bite force. Combined with the domed shape of its teeth that look perfectly suited for crushing, Terastiodontosaurus would have been a terrifying predator if you were a snail, easily capable of crunching through your shell. So it's a wonderfully weird worm lizard discovery. We've got some more worm news next, and no, it's not worm week yet, we've just been very lucky to have been blessed with so much wormy goodness. Anyway, paleontologists have just named a new species of very ancient worm dating back to over half a billion years ago, to the Ediacaran period, the period of time in which some of the very oldest animal fossils have been discovered. This new Ediacaran worm is named Uncus tsaugizi, and it was found in South Australia. This animal looks, well, a bit wormy. It might not seem all that exciting at first, however, this is a very intriguing find, as it could just be the oldest fossil evidence of a major grouping of animals. This group, called Ecdysozoa, includes all of the insects, arachnids, crustaceans, nematode worms, and a few other lesser known worm groups. The Ecdysozoans have long been suspected to have originated during the Ediacaran. However, no body fossils of these animals had been discovered from rocks dating to this time, which seemed like a little bit of a mystery to paleontologists. But the discovery of Uncus, which looks like it could be related to nematode worms, now proves much more definitively that these animals were indeed present in the Ediacaran. So once again, we've got very excited over a worm. And now we've got a study published in Science Advances that gives us a picture. Oh, my balls! And now we've got a study published in Science Advances that gives us a picture of early Mars that might suggest it was capable of housing life a very long time ago. We've had a number of studies recently that have made evaluations or re-evaluations on the habitability or past habitability of planets in our solar system. 
Just five weeks ago, we had a study that suggested that life could still exist on the red planet if certain parameters are met, as dust trapped in the Martian ice might block out enough radiation at a certain depth. Well, this study has looked at a much older version of Mars and concluded that hot water was present on Mars just under four and a half billion years ago. It was these kinds of conditions on Earth, it is believed, that were perfect for life to spawn on our own planet. We do, of course, have a lot of trouble studying Mars's ancient geology, as we are yet to have the capabilities of bringing rock samples back to Earth. We do occasionally get very lucky, though, as we have here, with Martian rock that just comes straight to us. This study used chemical data from the NWA7034 meteorite, a piece of Mars that was smashed off of the red planet by some massive impact and has found its way to our surface. It's a fascinating piece of evidence that has given us a rare insight into the history of one of the most hopeful neighbours for life in our solar system. A collection of pebbles from an archaeological site in Israel have been analysed, and it's thought that they may be spindle worlds, round, weighted objects used to spin fibres into yarn, representing a key milestone in the development of wheel technology. The stones were recovered from the Nahal Ein Gev II dig site in northern Israel, dating to around 12,000 years ago, during the Neolithic transition to an agricultural lifestyle. The authors have described more than a hundred of the predominantly limestone pebbles using 3D models. The pebbles are circular in shape with a central hole in the middle. This has led researchers to believe they are spindle whirls, donut shaped objects connected to a bar, forming a wheel and axle. These types of findings are usually associated with Bronze Age carts, but importantly, these finds date long before the time of Bronze Age cartwheels. The idea that these are indeed spindle wells is supported by some experimental archaeology, as replicas of the stones successfully spun flax. This technology may have paved the way for later rotational technologies vital to the development of early human civilizations. A fascinating study that demonstrates how modern technology can allow us to uncover the work of our ancestors. Also, in the recent wildlife news, scientists have discovered that some wolves might actually be pollinating plants. The pollination of flowers by mammals as they feed on nectar is already well known to occur since many kinds of bats get pollen on them as they go from plant to plant, and even some other kinds of non-flying mammals such as some rodents and primates have been observed pollinating too. A few small species of carnivoran mammals have been observed doing this as well, including civets and mongooses. But now, scientists have reported the first occurrence of a large-bodied carnivoran pollinating flowers, the Ethiopian wolf. They were seen licking the flowers of a plant called the Ethiopian red-hot poker and getting pollen all over their muzzles as they consumed the sweet nectar. Going from flower to flower, they were spreading this pollen and therefore acting as pollinators, helping the plants reproduce. It's amazing to think of these relatively big-bodied animals as pollinators when we're used to thinking mainly about insects performing this role. It's a very cool study, and we also really just wanted to talk about this mainly for the excuse to show you these adorable photos of the wolves feeding on the nectar. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in the last seven days of science. Uh, also, please do be sure to check out the link in the description to pre-order your very own scientifically accurate Spinosaurus plushie. We're calling him Swimbo, and he's absolutely adorable, but we do need your help to get him funded so he can actually be made. The details are on the site linked below.